okay, we're live here um, on Zoom. Surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the BSB Summer 2021. I think it's still 2021 Bookathon. <laughs> My name is Carson Tate, and I have the honor of moderating our first panel, which is called Keeping It Fresh. Um, I'm going to go around the room and introduce these folks. Um, so let's start with Jean Copeland. Raise your hand, Jean. Woohoo! She has a fancy background. Um, Jean is an author and high school English teacher from Connecticut. This year, she went on a writing hiatus to pursue her dream of participating in the 2021 Summer Teacher Olympics, in which she meddled in both binge watching and drinking. I was going to say <laughs> day drinking, but that's just drinking, period. <laughs> The Lazy Boy Recliner Division is now her official sponsor. Her eighth novel, Poison Pen, a contemporary romance, is available everywhere. Everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Jackie D lives in San Francisco East Bay with her wife's son and a gazillion pet friends. We'll talk numbers later. During the day, her job is to be Ron Swanson without the cynicism. And by night, she is a devoted snack winch to a three-year-old. Jackie has nine published novels, two of which came out this summer. Show off. Um, she is a co-host of the Sometimes Political, Sometimes Rambling podcast, The Weekly Wind Down, where she herds proverbial cats and tries to keep Aaron Zach and Jean Copeland on topic. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> I need a sandwich. So, so I, I told these folks that I would introduce them that they would introduce themselves. And then I told them I would introduce them. And then, you know, some sent me bios and some didn't. And so I just made up crap for the rest. <laughs> so, <laughs> Georgia is a full-time multi-award winning author of sweet and spicy romance novels. That's Georgia Beers, by the way. She spends her free time writing her Peloton, watching movies, drinking wine, and tending to the needs of two very cute pets. She's currently writing book number 6,000. <laughs> And we can only hope there are more on the way. <laughs> Julie Cannon leads a dual life by day. She wears a corporate suit and does bossy business things. But by night, she dons a silky negligee and pens the steamy romance novels we all like to read. In between, she raises a family with her lovely wife and soaks up the rays of the sun to recharge her creative powers. Very bossy good. business things. I love that. I know, right? <laughs> It's true, right, Julie? That's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Silk <laughs> negligee and all. Yeah, I'm not quite so sure about that, but you know, I keep it fresh, and I want to, and I'm a writer. I make it up, so it's good. Thank you. <laughs> so part of keeping it fresh, uh, for me anyway, part of keeping it fresh is identifying the things that are my like go tos, and then trying to figure out how to make them new and and um and fresh. Um. So I'm thinking like characters, tropes, descriptions, places, um, and then figuring out how to switch things up. So let's start with what are your favorites? What are your go-to things? Um, and we'll start from there and then kind of move into how you keep those things fresh. So Julie, mm -hmm. tell us all about it. I think, well, mine is, is all about romance. Um, it's typically has been um, successful executive women in a business setting um, for the most part. That's like how I started the first few and then it's just kind of delved from there. But it's, it's all a matter of what kind of pops in your head and when and, you know, how to keep it fresh. You just keep your eyes open. You get, I, I know I get motivated from a variety of ways, either something I see on the news or a photo I see or a comic I see or a phrase or something like that. So it's just a matter of um, just letting, letting the juices flow and they come at the oddest time. If you're sitting there trying to figure out what am I gonna write next, it doesn't happen. If you're you know, in the middle of a shower with shampoo screaming down your face, that's exactly when you figure out this is exactly the next award-winning book I'm gonna write. And then you gotta figure out how to remember it to write it down. Excellent and all true. Mm -hmm. Jean, how about you? What's your kind of go-to things that you comfort zone? Well, um, it, everything is always based in romance, but but I like to experiment with with different genres. I I I, I feel like the romantic blend is my is my thing, and so I will always take you know the, the basics of the romance between the characters, 
but then I'll, I'll try to put it in, you know, whether it's historic, whether it's mystery, whether it's um, suspense, as, as I did with Jackie and Aaron with Benjamin. I, I try to, I try to experiment in, in genres that I've never written before, only because I'm afraid that I could get stuck in tropes. And, and I, just from, from my perspective, I don't want to get stuck in them because I feel like I could. I love the, 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 the May, December thing. Um, I've written a couple that, that are, that have the May, December thing going on. Um, and I also like, I also like to, to complicate each love, each main character's circumstances so much to the point that it's like really angsty for them to try to get together. That's called um, torture. And <laughs> yeah, I think I'm a little bit of a sadist when it comes to that. Um, I, I like to throw these poor unassuming women into horrible situations and make them figure their own way out. Are you talking about your personal life, Jean, or your writing life? <laughs> you know what? There's an overlap. I won't <laughs> deny there's an overlap. All right, Jackie. <laughs> what's, your, what's your kind of go-to? <laughs> um, gosh, oh, I, wow. five I, minutes. You've got a bunch, a bunch of different genres too. So I do. I I genre hop a lot because I enjoy reading in a lot of different genres. Um, we're in a a fantastic time in um our niche right now where there's so many talented authors and so many talented artists out there who are producing work um, that it's kind of blown the gates wide open and it's allowed us the opportunity to explore things that we're interested in that maybe traditionally um, weren't avenues that we ventured down before. I like writing the suspense kind of thrillers because that's my favorite genre to read. Um, I'm also a big sucker for the paranormal. Um, but I struggle a little bit in the paranormal because I like to go off traditional canon sometimes and readers aren't always a big fan of going off canon uh, for stuff like that. But um, I enjoy writing in anything that excites me, much like Julie, it's kind of the idea that pops into my head and it's not necessarily tied to any, any one specific grouping of um, people or tropes or anything like that. Georgia. Well, it's pretty common knowledge that my favorite trope has generally been the office romance. Um, I've written a couple of those, or as I, you know, I will now call it doing bossy things with a <laughs> chick. Um, <laughs> I also big like bossy things. Exactly. Big exactly. Bossy. Big bossy things. Um, there are some that I haven't written yet. Like uh, I really like the fake romance. I know that that I think that some people would think that was overdone, but there's just something about it that's so much fun to have, you know, here, you pretend to be my girlfriend and then, oh, we're going to really fall in love. Um, I did it in a short story or in a novella, but I haven't done it as a full length novel. So I'd like to do that. Um, I like the celebrity romance. Um, I like friends to lovers. Enemies to lovers, I think is better only because you can like, there's that like uh, sexual attention that when hate turns to love, it's kind of sexy. Um, and like Julie, if I sit down, I, and I've said to you, Carson, I'm going to take today and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, brainstorm ideas. No, that means I'm going to sit in front of the TV. I'm going to watch some Netflix. I'm like, Jean, I'm going to day drink, right, Jean? Yep. And no ideas are going to come to me. That's what that day means. And then I'm going to be in the shower or I'm going to be driving even worse when I can't write anything down. And that's when the idea is going to come to me. I actually really need to get one of those whiteboards that goes in the shower. Oh. There, is, there is such a thing. And I remember um, a couple of years ago, I watched the movie Trumbo. Have you ever seen that movie about uh, Dalton Trumbo, one of the writers who was blacklisted back in the 40s, whatever that was. He wrote in the bathtub. <laughs> and I was like, that, that's me, that's me. All my ideas come either in the shower or in the car. So I need a whiteboard for the shower and I need like someone to sit in the back seat with a pen and pencil so that I can go, hey, here's the idea. <laughs> I always worry if I get the whiteboard for the shower that then the shower will not be my creative place anymore. <laughs> that could happen. It's very possible, very yeah. possible. <laughs> so, um, any, um, so you, 
some of you have identified kind of favorite tropes and things. So have you, do you, can you give me an example of how you may have turned that on its head or, you know, Julie, I mean, Jackie, you talked about going off canon. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so. And why don't you explain what you mean by that? <laughs> um, so there's a lot of, every genre has a group of really devoted readers and sci-fi has a group of really devoted readers and, you know, witches and vampires and those areas have a group of really devoted readers. And there's some traditional expectations that are set within those character types. And if you veer off of it, sometimes they get a little worked up about, <laughs> about it. And, you know, my, my favorite one was I, I had gotten a comment on a, I wrote a dystopian fiction novel um, called Rise of the Resistance. And it takes place, you know, a hundred years from now and yada, yada, yada. And um, the heroes, one of them had been cryogenically frozen and someone said, well, this is just unrealistic. And I was like, mm, I mean, <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> that's, that's kind of the point of it. <laughs> so it's just some people have real devoted ideas to it, but uh, you know, it doesn't really stop me from writing it anymore just because it's, I enjoy the new ideas. I've really enjoyed this kind of surge in women loving women literature that we've had lately. And um, I really enjoyed being able to read kind of the things that traips through people's minds that don't come from our traditional tropes. And um, so I, I think it's, it's best to kind of push those boundaries. I'm working on one right now um, that it's about a vampire who doesn't uh, drink blood, but not because they're a vegetarian or anything, but because of a uh, history they have of protecting a realm. So it's, um, I've, I have fought off against the urges to not um, give in to the canon tropes just to keep certain people happy because I think we're not gonna push ourselves any further if we do that. So that's kind of what I mean by it. How about you, Julie? I, I'm thinking, I mean, you could talk about whatever you want, but I'm thinking about a particular book you wrote that really didn't have, um, it was a romance novel. I call it the jungle book because I can't remember the title. I'm sorry, but um, <laughs> you know, but it was a fantastic book. It got a starred review from Publishers Weekly, as I recall, it was, yeah. but it had something a little different from a romance that we don't usually see. That's correct. So shameless. She just happens to have it. <laughs> yeah, shameless publication. I reached behind me on my bookshelf and pulled it out. You pulled it right out of that blue oh. background. <laughs> <laughs> and there it was. <laughs> it's like magic. That's how ideas come to us. It's magic. But you're right, Carson. And I was I was thinking of, of just that. So I wrote this book, and yeah, we call it the jungle book in my house, too. And um, you know, it's about two women who um, were kidnapped and held in the Colombian jungle. And one of them is rescued and the other one isn't. And the, the one that's rescued comes back and get the other one, et cetera, et cetera. And um, there is absolutely no sex in this book. Not, not real time, not think back before and not fantasize of what could be. None. There is there isn't, there's barely any attraction between the two that's recognized. And I was quite concerned about it because, you know, from what people tell me, you know, my books are romance and they've got sex in them and, and sometimes a lot of sex and hopefully steamy sex. And this one had absolutely nothing. And I was very concerned about it. And I reached out to my editor and said, I, I have this, you know, this thought, but no place in this book does sex fit anywhere between the two of them. And she said, then, you know, she said, let me read it and then we'll go from there. And so she read it and she came back and she said, you're right. And it's perfect just the way that it is. So, and it did, it got, it got really good reviews because it's all about the story between the people. Well, I have to tell you, I, I read it and then I, you told me later that there was no sex in it, but that wasn't my recollection. You know, like, I, I mean, I felt the chemistry, you know, but yeah, but it was different because it was very, you know, I, I don't know, it wasn't, your, it wasn't typical, a typical romance novel in that you got to see anything like that on the page. It wasn't even, there wasn't even fade to black, really. It was just, no. kind of, yeah. There was, mm -mm. yeah, that was, 
But, but that's, you know, that's one of the cases where that's just the way the story came out. That's the way it came out of me. And, and other stories come out, you know, in, 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 in different ways. And that's just the way this one did. So the book you have on your blue magic bookshelf there uh-huh. is um, Summer Loving. And that's a little different, too. So tell us it, a little bit about that. It is. It's three novellas. Um that I wrote. And so they're three separate stories, but the three women all work in the same place. And um, the boss lets them spend a month doing volunteer work someplace in the world. And she said, you know, you worked your asses off this year. So I want you to go someplace exotic and someplace beautiful, because even those places have people in need. And it has to be someplace that's needy, like Habitat for Humanity or something like that. So, so it's three different women and they all go off to an exotic place and, and do their, and spend their month long um, volunteer work there. And it was really hard to write. I thought it would be easy because I, I don't know about, you know, those of us here, but when I hit about the 20,000 word mark, that's like the first third is done, the middle third, you slog through, you think you're never going to see the end and then the end really picks up. So I thought, well, I'll just write something that, you know, is really good and I'm excited about and zoom, zoom, zoom. And then it's done. (laughs) You know, the first one was fine. The second one was okay. Now what? Because they are three very distinct stories. So I had to write three very different books and they were right on top of each other. And so there was no time to decompress from one story to go to another story. And so it, it was a lot harder than I thought it was gonna be. Um, and then when I, after I wrote it all and I was proofreading and I got to the second story and I thought, didn't I say that before? And so I had to do the word search and you're right. I said that phrase two other times in this other story. Now. In a full 60,000 word book, 70, 80,000 word book, it's not a problem if you repeat it a couple of times and then your next book, you might repeat the same kind of phrase, but when you do it all in one, you're repeating yourself. So um, it was a lot harder than it looked and I'm not sure I would do it again. (laughs) (laughs) Well, but it looks nice on the shelf right now and everybody should go buy it. (laughs) Georgia, how about you? Turning a trope on its head. Um... You know, I don't know that I've ever turned a trope on its head. I just, for me, I think the big changes are about the setting. Um, I can write different office romances, but it's not always going to be the boss and the secretary or the boss and the subordinate. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like, I like shoving people together when they're not expecting it. And now you have to work together. Um, I've done that a couple of times. I'm trying to think back of, I think that I've written a couple of office romance adjacent kind of books too, like 16 Steps to Forever were people that worked together, but they worked for two different companies, but they had to work together um, because their bosses put them together. So I like it to be out of their control. Um, Mm -hmm. And I, it's funny because Jackie talked about writing in different genres. And I too love suspense and thrillers and psychological drama. Those are my favorites. Um, But I don't know that I can do a good job writing them. I so admire people who write those because I just, I, I fear the details. (laughs) I fear the little, the, the strings that are not tied up at the end. Um, I'm pretty good at figuring out things like who the bad guy is, but I don't know that I could craft that myself. So I tend to stay in this lane mm-hmm. and read, but, but like look longingly at those other lanes because I want to be in those lanes, but I'm afraid of those lanes. So I tend to stick with my, with my romance. Um, and I'm trying to branch out a little bit because I think there's only so much of the same trope you can do before people start going, you know so I'm trying some different stuff the series that I just wrote was definitely different um tell us a little bit about that that is it's the swizzle stick romances and I love in mainstream I love the Jill Shalvises and the Nora Roberts when they write a series that's about a bunch of siblings and each book 
has the sibling, a different sibling finding love, um, which is a little bit harder to do in the queer community. I mean, it's been done. I've known siblings that are both queer, but it's not common. Um, so I didn't want to do something in, as Jackie said, have readers be like, well, that's unrealistic. Um, so I come from an Italian family that's quite large and there are nine, I have nine cousins and four of us are gay. So <laughs> I was like, okay, that I can do. <laughs> so I took three cousins and I gave them, I gave one cousin a bar and the back room of the bar is where they all meet and navigate through life and love and help each other out. And um, one of the things that I did with them that I thought was kind of fun was I made them quite different ages. One is 34, one is 38, one is 48. So like they're not all crammed together, which means they have different experiences in life. So I kind of liked that. That was a little different and it made each book a little different. Um, so that was fun. That was fun. The first one just came out in August and I'm, I'm interested. It's gotten pretty good reviews. So I'm interested to see how the other two are um, accepted. I will say with Julie, she talked about the first third and the second third and the third third of the book that worked for the series for me. Well, that's usually how it works for the series for me. Usually if you're writing a three book series, the first one you're all excited about because it's new. Mm -hmm. And then the second one writes pretty quickly on its own because you know, all of the settings, and you know, the people, and then the third one, you're kind of bored and you just have to slog through <laughs> and be done. You're, you're finished with these people. But with this series that didn't happen. And I wrote the last book and I was actually really sad to have it finish. Um, I had a point where I was writing kind of slowly and I, there was an epiphany where I realized that I wasn't writing slowly because I didn't know where I was going. I was writing slowly because I didn't want to say goodbye to these characters. So that was new for me. So more cousins need to come out. <laughs> <laughs> and my cousin, one of my cousins who's, who's gay is eight years older than me. And I followed her to college or six years older than me. I followed her to college. I went to the same, like she took me under her wing. And so I was like, I can write this. This is realistic. This is how this has happened to me. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Yeah. Jean, talk to us about tropes on their heads. <laughs> no, I, I uh, try to do it. I don't, I don't know if I succeed at it. Um, but what I usually do is, is because I, I, I tend to write in different genres, I could take a trope and like, for instance, the, the May, December thing, I, I did that in my historic fiction, but then I also did it in, in a fully contemporary one. So I might take a trope that I personally like, but if I apply it in different genres under different circumstances, then it's not, to me anyway, it's, it's not quite as obvious because there are other factors that are kind of, that the, that the characters are dealing with. Um, like and in the society revolution- probably looks at people differently. I mean, you know, looks at those, those tropes differently. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. With, with the revelation of Beatrice Darby, that was, that was set in the late fifties, early sixties. And you had- That's such a, a cool title. I love that title. Is it really? Yeah, it's great. I love it. Just like, I just love it. Sorry, okay. go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I, 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 I had her, it, the, the character follows Beatrice from like the time she's almost 18 to the time she's 28. So it's basically those formative years, but because it's in the late fifties, early sixties, she, she looks toward an older woman as a role model and ends up falling in love with her. Um, and, and, you know, the role model slash safety net because, hey, this is such a weird thing we're talking about, but at least I know somebody else is just like me. So that was unique to that. But then I also used it in a contemporary in Summer Fling. They also had an age gap in there. And, and it was a conflict for very different reasons. And I, and I got to explore that same, that same trope, but because the, we're coming from two different um, time periods, social context, I could kind of get away with the recycling a little bit longer if I'm using it in different genres. So now you have to write future May, December romance, <laughs> dystopian that's, May, December romance. <laughs> that's on the list. It's on the list. Believe me, it is. <laughs> it's called the world doesn't have as many people left, so you just take who you get. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, you're like writing the book for me right now. It's awesome. <laughs> so you're recording this, right? Because I'm going to come back to this later. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about. Um, 
let's talk about names and places and settings and things like that. Um, I know I have like, Ashley Bartley used to read for me before she became an editor and then got paid to do it. <laughs> um, and she would always tell me, you know, you named someone this like two in three of your other books. <laughs> In fact, she gave me an old yearbook, you know, it's like, use this, <laughs> like, find names somewhere else, because you keep repeating them. Um, so let's talk about names and places and descriptions and things like that. Um, how do you keep those fresh? How do you, where, what are your sources? Um, let's start with you, Jackie. Um, sorry, I've been on mute. I don't know if you can hear my puppy snoring, but he snores like an 80-year-old man, so I try to. <laughs> Thor. Thor. Yeah. Um, I actually ran into that instance once when uh, I wrote Land's End. Um, <laughs> I had used Brittany, who we ended up using as a character, a main character in Swift Vengeance. Um, in uh, Land's End, I'd actually given her the last name of O'Brien. Um, I didn't realize that I had named my bad guys in my sequel, the last name O'Brien. So <laughs> um, I had like frantically texted Jean and Aaron and I was like, could we not use last names in this one? So we just scrapped the last names, which made me very cognizant of doing it ever again. My answer is going to be super boring. Um, I play around with a name generator online. Um, so that I can kind of avoid that. And there are some that you can actually, especially um, Aaron and I are also working on another kind of futuristic book, um, which we wanted to have real specific um, kind of backgrounds of ethnicities represented. So you can actually, there's some that you can actually go in and kind of put in where you want their background from and it generates some um, names for you that maybe you'd never even considered before. So it's not the, the super fun answer that I think most people think, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I use a name generator for, for most of mine now. No, th those are fantastic. I, I think they're, they're really great. And, and sometimes you may not use the name, but it inspires you about. Right. How about you, Julie? Where do you come up with names and places and descriptions and clothing? How about clothing? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think what I need to do now is I need to go back through all my books. I need to create like a chart that says, here's the book. Here's the main characters, first and last. Here's everybody that's in it. Because I think I'm starting to like, did I use that name already or something like that? Um, in uh, my editor, Shelly definitely keeps me honest because she sent back my second uh, revisions to the one I'm currently working. She said, there's a lot of M's in this story. There's a Morgan and a Max and a Monty. And you don't want to do that. You don't want to have characters, any characters, any names in your story that have the, typically start with the same first letter because it's harder to keep them straight, so to speak. Um, so it's like, oh, God, I guess you're right. But I like all those names. I, I don't use a name generator, but, but boy, I wrote that down because I think that's like really cool. I, I start out with what do I think my character is and what, what do I want them to be? And to me, a name kind of says everything about the character. And um, so I just kind of, okay, if this is the strong androgynous character, then it kind of needs that kind of name that it can't be Becky or anything like that. Um, so I just kind of kind of think them through a little bit, but once I get a name, well, and, and quite frankly, how easy is it to type? Because you're, oh, typing, yeah. it, you're typing it thousands of times. And like, I would love to use um, um, Clarice. And I thought, well, that's a really cool name. Well, it's kind of hard to, to type, but okay, I get it. And I would also like, I would really like to use Elise. Um, I think it's a beautiful name, but a friend of mine says, every time I would read it, I would see Elsie the cow. So I can never use Elise because I'm thinking this is Elsie the cow. So, you know, it's kind of like naming your kids too. Well, what if I name them Rebecca? Oh, I knew somebody in high school that was Rebecca and ugh, no. So it's not, sometimes it's, it's not easy to, to pick your names. How about, um, how about you, Jean? And feel free to veer off names. Um, 
talk about anything, anything. I, going back to the title of The Revelation of Beatrice Darby, I needed an old fashioned name, but I'm a huge fan of Beatrice Arthur. So I'm like, well, all right, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna do that and I'm gonna start there. Um, but usually, it, usually it's a very difficult thing for me. And, and if, I don't, if I don't name the characters, I find it really hard to write about them. Mm -hmm. so, so I go through this period where I'm like, I, I, know this, I know what I want the story to be. I kind of have an idea who these characters are and, and I wanna start writing, but if I can't name them, it's it's like it's just so hard to do that. So they're not real. Like yeah, exactly. I mean, how can you if somebody doesn't have a name? How do you how do you like try to get in their heads? Yeah. So for for my book, One Woman's Treasure, I, I I think that was book number five. At that point, I said, you know what? I'm not messing with this nonsense. I'm gonna name every single character after an animal I either knew or owned. So every single character in One Woman's Treasure is named after a pet I either owned or had. That's awesome. You, you, so much, not, <laughs> you would not believe how easily <laughs> I translated into the story. Once, like, one of my main characters, Daphne, that was my cat. And then her love interest, Nina, was a, a lady I played bingo with, dog's name. So I got my cat... And, and my bingo friend's dog, and they're falling in love, and I'm writing about it. And, 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 and I needed a last name because I couldn't, I didn't want to give Daphne Copeland my last name because that was her real name. So I named her Daphne Carson after you, Carson. Oh, well, thank you. I, I did that because <laughs> I, I, don't, I couldn't take the Copeland because that would be too, like, narcissistic. So I said, all right, I want it to be a C. So I'm like, how about Daphne Carson? I thought so it I have this entire what? I thought it was me, but you know. <laughs> I have this entire book full of characters that are all pets that I know what they all look like. And if anybody wants to email me privately, if you've read One Woman's Treasure, I will give you actual photos of every pet that's in that book. That's just an aside. I feel like, like you should make that like one of those matching games online and like give away a prize. You know, oh my like, God, here, are the yes. pets, here are the names. Is this character a dog or a cat? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Georgia. <laughs> I really can't follow that. I can't follow I would, that. Yeah. Um, I have, I don't, the name generator sounds like a really cool idea. I am old school and I have a name book. <laughs> um, also, one of the things that I tend to do is when I figure out how old my character is, I will go to baby names that are popular for that year that they were born just to make sure that I'm not naming them something that, you know, would never have been, they would never have been named in that year. Um, I find that cemeteries are great places for last names. Oh. Um, and that, it's funny because foolishly appealing it, well the, and there's I mean it's just a name it's just a name it's okay um I also find that like for me I usually have a visual of the character and in my head she's usually some kind of a celebrity an actress or a singer or something and oftentimes her name in the book will have something to do with her like either her first name, her last name, a character that she's played. Um, I've done that before. Um, I have a list on my phone. And whenever I hear a cool name, I put it on the list. Um, and it's gotten actually really long. And I've added to it pet names because those are fun. Um, so I just, I did have one instance. I mean, I've written, when, when you've started to write, when you've written a, as many books as I have, it gets hard to, like, I can't remember. I can't remember. <laughs> some of the old ones and for the secret poet my lead character of morgan her name was abby and i that i didn't start the book but i had like the blurb written and i was going and i thought did i use that name already and i literally had to go through my books and look at this at the blurbs on the back and i found it it was uh it was olive oil and white bread no 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 it was it was the plain one 96 hours one of them was abby and I was like, okay, nope, can't do that anymore. Um, and I changed it to Morgan. I also find, as Julie said, that if I know somebody, 
they can ruin a name for me. <laughs> so there are names that I like that I will probably never use because I've met somebody who's ruined that name for me. That happens too. Um, I think teachers go through that as well. Like, yep. and Jean, that's gotta be hard for you. You have like how many students every year that must like eliminate <laughs> half of the names of the world for you. You're like, no, I'm not naming it after that little bastard. You know? <laughs> True story. It's funny because Jean said right? she would never name a character after Carson because she couldn't stand her. But I mean, I guess she did. So. <laughs> that is so not true. You know, Carson's my secret crush. What are you trying to screw <laughs> up here? Dwyer, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the cat is out of the bag. <laughs> I, last, I was trying to figure out a last name of one of my characters, and I thought Carson's like, no, I can't put Carson because then Carson's gonna think I'm sucking up to her. So I can't. Bean already sucked up to her. So. <laughs> I already covered that. <laughs> my next character's last name is gonna be Radcliffe. So see if everybody <laughs> step off. Oh. <laughs> uh. So um, just want to remind everybody, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box. We will be happy to answer them. Um, so I, I, I want to know about like clothing and because I'm curious about like, are you so fashion forward that you can just describe what your characters are wearing just off the top of your head? Do you go to magazines? Do you go online? You know, how, how important is clothing, you know, to, to what you're writing? So I'm just looking for fashion tips and I would like to start with you, G Jackie. Jack there's, <laughs> <laughs> there's lots it of all with the same panel. sound. So it could have been any one of us. All the just sounds are on the right. same. <laughs> um, it depends on what I'm writing about. Um, and it depends on who I'm writing about. So well, let's talk about VIP because you've got two. Oh. So for VIP, I had two very distinct people in mind when I was writing it. So um, <laughs> you and Jean, yeah, that's absolutely correct. Whenever I think of really hot celebrities, it's like Carson and Jean Copeland, like what else is there? So <laughs> I went, I stalked your guys' Facebook and I, no, um, I had two very definite celebrities in mind when I wrote that book. So um, I spent a lot of time online, uh, kind of looking at them in different red carpet events and um, kind of their their sense of uh, fashion and what they like to wear. Um, I also do kind of the same thing um, when if we're writing something that took place back in time, I spend a lot of, I spend way more time than I've ever spent in my real life looking at clothes, like in the reasons for clothes and, you know, kind of the choices that were made um, when and where, because it is, all we can do is describe them. We can't actually show people pictures of them. So um, the clothes that they wear and kind of the accessories that they have are really going to point to their personalities and what they're interested in and what's important to them. So I do take a lot of care in what I dress them in because I also think it gives them a certain attitude or a certain uh, persona or um, it will also give impressions to the people around them and the characters that they're interacting with. So I, do, I spend quite a bit of time researching clothes and um, accessories, which is a sentence I never thought I would say. So here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Julie, how about you? <laughs> I, I look like Jackie in that I wish there were bear animals for grownups because <laughs> I'm horrible when it comes to stuff like that. I know black goes with this and blue goes with that. And I'm just, I'm, I'm just not savvy like that. So I uh, thank God for the internet or we would spend all of our free time and even not free time at the library. And whereas now you can kind of go, okay, you can type in, you can Google executive females and poof up pops, you know, 10,000 photos and you can see what they're wearing and say, okay, now, how would I describe that jacket? It has no lapels, it has a mandarin collar, you know, I can't, sometimes I, I can think that way, but usually I have to see it to be able to write it because I'm, I'm just not that, I didn't get that gene from wherever it is that it came from. I must have missed that day in the womb because I didn't get it. <laughs> Thank God I have a wife or ooh, it could be a whole lot scarier. Georgia, do you have the, fashion jean? I wish I did. I, I'm not great at it. I tend to buy things right off the mannequin, like the whole outfit. Um, 
And for character, I mean, I'm okay at it. I'm just, I'm, I fall somewhere between terrible and really good. Like I'm in the middle. I, I can get by, I can get by. Um, I, I used to be really, really detailed with what my characters wore. I used to get, you know, down to what kind of top and what color buttons. And I don't think I, I am as detailed anymore unless the clothing is very important to the person, unless she's got a lot of money and, you know, I need to know designer names. I do a lot of Google searches. I do a lot of internet shopping because I want to see what goes together. Um, if I see somebody wearing something that I think is really cool, I'll file that away and I'll put it on a character at some point. Um, but I really do think it depends on the character. You know, I think there are some characters that it doesn't really matter. I can say she's wearing jeans and a blue top and that's good enough. Um, and then there are some where, you know, if they're dressed up, if they're dressing up, I need to describe that dress. I need to describe those heels. Um, same thing with makeup. I think with makeup, you know, not a lot of my characters wear a lot of makeup, but they all wear a little bit. Um, so I tend to talk about that, but it's not super detailed. Um, I will go to, like, if I want her wearing a, a blue short sleeve top, I'll Google blue short sleeve tops and I'll find something that I'm like, okay, that, or I'll go to Macy's.com. Um, or if she's a little more outdoorsy, I'll go to LL Bean and I'll find something for her to wear there. I've done that before. And I've actually found characters in things like the Eddie Bauer catalog that I don't get anymore. But I remember years ago, I was searching through the Eddie Bauer cat catalog and I was like, oh, she's really pretty. I'm going to make her a character. And I did <laughs> complete in that outfit and everything. <laughs> like a storyboard. of <laughs> Exactly. I, I think I cut it out and I put it on the, I use the magnet and put it on the board. <laughs> Jean, clothes horse or not? <laughs> I'm, I'm what you'd call fashion backward. And, uh, you know, it, like, whatever the basics are um if like everybody said if if the outfit is is important to the character like like usually it's i'll describe an outfit when the love interest looks at her and right. notices something that she's wearing then i will pay attention to to what that character is wearing but for the most part like georgia said i'll put i'll have the jeans and the blue v-neck i'll you know i'll have the business suit, but I won't go into a lot of detail unless, unless that is central to the other character actually getting an impression of her from it. Um, I, you know, I personally don't put a whole heck of a lot of, of time into clothes or makeup. I do wear clothes. I do wear makeup. <laughs> But, but I, I don't put a lot of a lot of effort into it and and you know for good or for bad that that translates into 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 my writing um I don't know maybe that's something I should think about maybe that's something I should think about maybe if I dress my characters up a little more maybe that that'll give it an, give them another dimension that I didn't think about um but but for the most part yeah that's that's where. I kind of, I'm, I'm lax. I'm lax in dressing them up. No, no judgment here. And I think, um, I think you all made great points about how when it matters, you provide the detail. And I think that's, right. you know, the key. We've, we do have an audience question. And um, so this is good. Do any of you turn to Shakespeare, Austin, or even someone like Moliere for ideas? to use and or turn on their heads. Like Georgia just went back to Cyrano de Bergerac for the secret poet. Um, so, you know, and there's been lots of pride and prejudice and other things. <laughs> um, so any of you inspired by the classics to reinvent your stories or, or thinking about it for the future? That's a good question. And I think, I think, um, I hesitate to do that because I'm afraid I'll screw it up. Um, Cyrano de Bergerac is a pretty common trope and it's, it's, it's pretty basic. I mean, it's not like super detailed. Um, and I've been wanting to do that for a long time. So when it, the idea finally came to me, I, I ran with it. Um, I know Karen Callmaker has done Jane Austen a couple of times. Um, I don't know. It just never really occurred to me. I think I think we all do an element of that. I mean, is it Shakespeare that said there's nothing new under the sun? 
I mean, we're, none of us are going to come up with a, in a very, like a completely original idea. It's all been done, but we're all going to put our own spin on it. So I would guess that we probably have all and been inspired by the classics and maybe not realized it. I don't know. Well, Jean, I, 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 you, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I haven't yet. I mean, I'm, I'm only on my eighth book. So I, I have a backlog of ideas that I'm still putting into motion, but I certainly would not, I would not discount that as far as, you know, looking for new inspiration you know, the minute I don't have an idea, you know, there, there are some great Shakespeare plays that I would love to try to explore in a mm -hmm. modern lesbian way. Um, you know, a couple of, uh, well, well, Jack, when Jackie and I did Spellbound, you know, Arthur Miller's The Crucible was, was a big influence on me when I was writing the, the, the Puritan characters. So in that, in that sense, yeah, I did kind of fall back on the crucible because I love that play so much. I teach it. I just enjoy it. Um, so if it's necessary and if I could do it without, you know, like completely ripping it off. Yeah. I, I would totally be open to it. Awesome. Anyone else? Screw the classics. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I think we all do pull from those. Um, I think that's a really good point. So we have just one more, few more minutes. Um, so does anyone have a fun anecdote about a strategy you use to keep things fresh besides Jackie's name generator? <laughs> There's no fun amongst this group. There's no fun. We are unfun. <laughs> <laughs> keeping it fresh is a hard arduous difficult thing that we all struggle with on the daily it's true it's true so yeah. i will tell you something that helps me i will if i am completely like out of ideas and something always shows up that's the thing that i i i have yet to accept yeah. because i get panic stricken but something shows up eventually. It always does. But if I need to nudge things, I will go to the Hallmark movie website and I'll just read synopses of every movie they have. And then something will go, oh, what if you took that and you took that and you twisted it this way and you <laughs> added that? That's how it happens for me sometimes. So if I'm stuck, that will usually give me the push out of the rut that I need, but something always shows up. And I don't know why Carson and I have had this discussion. I don't know why after 30 odd books, I still panic, but I do. <laughs> when I get that email from Sandy that says, I need your next blurb. I'm always like, Oh my God, this is it. I'm done. I'm done. There's no more. The well is dry. <laughs> but something shows up. So I think that we all just need to have a little faith that this is what we do when we're good at it. Yeah. So well, you guys I, have that, does it happen for the rest of you? Do you like panic? And then all of a sudden something shows up and you're like, Whoosh. always. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Always. Yeah. You know, and it was like the other day, like I, I'm trying to figure out what to write next for the, like, Oh my God, what do I, what do I write? What do I write? What do I write? And, um, I saw the scene on the news that everybody has seen in Afghanistan and the huge military plane going down the runway and all the people that are flocking there. And I first, you know, other than the, the trauma associated with something like that, I thought, what if my main character is that pilot? Oh, wow. And, you know, I- Let me get a pen, Julie. Hang on. Tell me more. <laughs> right back. What is that? <laughs> My next character is that pilot and talk about some serious PTSD in feeling like they have failed the thousands of people that are on the runway yeah. or, or it's a phrase in a song or something like that. It's like, you know, I really like that. Now, how can I build a story around that? Mm -hmm. And how can I get these two people together all the time for the exactly. And if you just, like I said in the beginning, if you just kind of keep your eyes open around you and, you know, I saw, there's a, here's a car accident and here's these two people talking and yep. maybe that could be a story. So, yeah, but you're right. You do get the, oh my God, what am I going to do next? And, and <laughs> I, is this it? So, 
Well, I would like to thank all of you for being a fun and fancy panel um, for our very first panel of the Bookathon. Next up, we have an author chat with Jean Copeland. Woohoo, she and Jackie D and Aaron Zach talking about their co written book, uh, Swift Vengeance. So, um, can we drink for that one, or are we still on like the. Yeah, you can, you can drink for any of them, Jackie. <laughs> drink for all of them. Why not? Listen, we ha- I have to be on three of these, and then we have to record a podcast. And if I do that, then I'm just, I'm going to be more I- fun. The more you drink, the more fun you are. <laughs> I'm just going to be Don't leaning you know against this? the computer screen by the <laughs> I've been drinking since noon. All right, kids. <laughs> Wave goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.